everyone. I am here at the historic post office block in Abilene, Kansas. Part of Ike's childhood memories where he would race down to the billiards hall in this building and get scores from the World Series games across the wire if they posted them on the wall. So my name is Michael Hook with the Eisenhower Foundation. Uh, today we present the Red Scare Spies Among Us, discussing one of the most difficult decisions any president has had to make just to begin his term. Follow along with me as we go through this uh, fantastic presentation here. So I'm going into Eisenhower's Dilemma. There we go. Just for a short few months into his first term, President Eisenhower had to decide the fate of two Americans. They were dealt a wrong hand and fell on the wrong side of a Soviet spy ring. The Rosenberg case was decided on many levels of courts that these two Americans deserve to be executed. Ike's power of executive clemency would be the only thing to save them. What is executive clemency? Executive clemency is the power of the president in federal criminal cases to pardon a person convicted of a crime. He can also shorten the sentence, or in this case, reduce the death penalty to a lesser sentence. All presidents except for two since George Washington have used some form of clemency through their terms. The 20th century alone saw 20,000 individual cases where executive clemency was used by the president. Even Eisenhower would use his power for 1,100 times during his two terms. In a case where two alleged spies were set to be executed by the electric chair, would Eisenhower step in and save them? We're going to make you President Eisenhower for a day, and you are going to be able to fill his shoes and decide the fate of the Rosenbergs. This is what I kind of want you to focus on, uh, Mr. or Madam President. You are going to have access to several primary sources written at the time of the event to help you make your decision. You are also granted access to confidential documents that the public will not be able to see. So your decision will be, number one, will you grant clemency to Julius Rosenberg? Secondly, will you grant clemency to Ethel Rosenberg? And third, when you make that decision, we appreciate if you have something to write with, a piece of paper and a pencil, and write down some notes as we're going along with these documents and see what when you make your decision if you're able to justify to the public. So I wish you the best of luck to you and Godspeed. Let's begin with the official uh, court uh, decision here, which was Rosenberg versus the United States, June 18th, 1953. They actually argued it on June 18th, 1953. They decided on June 19th, 1953. The Rosenbergs were convicted and sentenced to death for conspiring to violate the Espionage Act of 1917 by communicating to a foreign government in wartime, secret atomic and other military information. As we go back to your decision here, keep that in mind. When we say you're going to grant them elected executive clemency, you're basically saying you do not want them to go to the electric chair. You as president will have to step in and save these two people. If you say no, you will not grant executive clemency, that means you are going to allow the courts to uphold their decision and move them into the electric chair. That is a huge decision for you. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. I would not want to switch places with you. We'll begin where, how did we get here? The Cold War was first coined in 1945 and described the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union that lasted for decades. It got its name because both sides were not willing to engage into a hot war, meaning man-to-man -man combat, but technology created a new fear, a new weapon with the power to destroy entire cities. What caused this rivalry? Basically, it was a difference of opinion between our governments, between democracy and communism, and the Soviets were about to flex their post-war power. Communism, what is it? Well, we're not going to get too much into the details on communism versus socialism, so we'll make it as elementary as we can for you. The simplified version is created by Karl Marx in the 1840s as a system where all property is public, all people work, uh, and are given things by the government according to their needs. Unlike democracy, communism is moneyless, there is no class system, and there are no elected officials. Oftentimes, this formula swings too much power to the government. This is contradictory to the democratic values of this country. 
So as we get into the big three, we're going back to World War II. And you can see a sickly English prime minister on the left, that is Winston Churchill. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt is just about two months from his death in this picture. And then Soviet Chairman Joseph Stalin would also die within a few years of this picture. So these three leaders who were the most powerful people in the world came together a very sickly state. But notice how we present them in the media. You would never see FDR sitting in a wheelchair. They always made him look strong, powerful, because we don't want the enemy to think we are weak. That was the responsibility of the media to portray these guys as powerful people. We're gonna get into a video. You're gonna see back then, before we start getting into the Red Scare, the uh, Soviets and us were best friends almost. And you're gonna see some great images from the Moscow embassy. Obviously not a lot of you can read this uh, Russian language here, but there are numbers and what they're specifically relating to is even before we got into the war in 1941, uh, we were sending weapons and equipment to the Soviet Union to help fight the Nazi invaders. American supplies to the Soviet Union under the Lend-Lease Law of 1941 through 1945 totaled $11.3 billion, or in today's money, $180 billion. This was done in support of the great and difficult struggle against our common enemy, bloody Hitlerism, as Stalin wrote in his letter to Roosevelt. This is very powerful imagery here. You can really see that the Americans, the British, the uh, Soviets are all working together hand in hand. It becomes in a very short time, almost heads up upon the, the surrender of Japan, that all of a sudden Soviets are public enemy number one. But very powerful uh, imagery in those in that video. All right, we want to take a look at these primary sources, which are these posters of that time period. And uh, in the 40s and the 50s, you're going to see this is the representation of what communism is uh, to the Americans. So um, if anybody wants to throw in, we're going to open the conversation. If you want to talk out, that's going to give us a little bit more time for the presentation. So if somebody wants to come out and tell us, what do you see when you see these posters? What's the image that they're trying to capture here? We'll have an interesting lull of silence just for a minute, but if anybody wants to jump in, we have a bunch of teachers out of Chicago we're excited to hear from too. Um, Emily Wagner, she says they're playing off fears. Um, we have another answer. It, it's provoking evil. Yeah, those are beautiful answers. We do appreciate the, uh, the red. Look how powerful that is. Even when we go to the Eisenhower Museum, you will see red placed very strategically in that museum. Red is the enemy and blue becomes the very powerful color of good. So uh, you can see really how they're representing that very well. We're going to show you. We're going to show you video coming up that's going to represent uh, um, what the thoughts of being communist in this country was and uh, it is very powerful on how they're representing it in the public eye. Call this a communist now, communist style. 
as part of a long-range plan to destroy our free way of life. These young communists are studying the economic, the political, and religious institutions that are the very heartbeat of America. The course is here in this strangest of all schools. Espionage as a science. Propaganda as an art. So some very powerful images on this as we go through, but uh, what do you think it would have been for if you were been implied with these socialist or communist groups? Uh, anybody want to comment on how do you think the treatment would have been for you here in America? You know, people from all over the country here, we are very excited to touch into some of you guys as well. Uh, Long Island, New York, we're excited to have you here. Not nice. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Not nice. Anybody else have an opinion they want to add to? You pretty much hit down the, the bullet point there. Um, another panelist says death. Yeah, exactly. In the case of the Rosenbergs, we're going to see if they are going to be convicted to be uh, sentenced. Aisha says this is a great one, that they would feel isolated. Yeah, very isolated. Uh, so they are making it very difficult for you to be an American if you are connected. Whether or not you're connected or not, if you had any kind of ties or they were implicating you, you're on a bad list to be on. And we saw that happen to actors and actresses and authors and people from all walks of life getting uh, implicated in this. Uh, you would obviously be connected with the enemy. And that's something that nobody needs to be. So, so here is the new evil. With all this information that you've gathered so far, what do you think the new evil is? And uh, use this picture to help you out a little bit. Amy says it's the atomic bomb. Yes, very good. And with the end of World War II, what happened? Well, we have Hava and David, they also mention a nuclear holocaust. Yeah, it's going to be a bad deal. We find we have access to a weapon that could kill, in the case of Japan, 130,000 people with one bomb. And within a few months, the Soviets will have the same technology. They are clearly no longer our allies. They are public enemy number one, and they have that same power that we had before. So how do we get to that point? Well, we want to take you into the secrets and codes. Uh, and find out what's going on on the Soviet side. So though the results of World War II may have been very different if the Soviets were fighting on the other side, we are so thankful that Stalin and Hitler did not get along. Uh, there was a distrust between both sides, the Americans and the Soviets, even during World War II. Secretly, the US was working on a project to create the ultimate weapon. It wouldn't be long until the Soviets would catch on. And the picture on the bottom right, this is uh, Albert Einstein and uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who are working together on the American side, even though they had European ties. Uh, they basically said, you know, we think that the enemy is working on this. Their scientists, their teams are trying to do the same thing we're doing. So we need to get on the front side. So Oppenheimer took it upon himself to start the Manhattan Project, which was actually started during World War II. And it developed the world's first atomic weapon and started under the Manhattan and an engineer district in New York City. Eventually, Oppenheimer would move the team to Los Alamos, New Mexico, because it's desolate. It's kind of all by itself in that area. You won't even find Los Alamos on most maps. So that was a good spot to do these secretive projects, and you could blow up a good portion of it without affecting any citizens. So that's where they're going to have their testing grounds. Uh, and these are some of the most brilliant minds of all time. And sadly, when we had that connection with the Soviets, they kind of crossed over to our side of the fence. Yeah. I have a question from Aisha, and, and she mentioned um, the Soviets with their atomic weaponry research, they were ahead of the U.S. So was the Red Scare, why was it so big in the, why was it so big and so intense? Just the opposite. Yeah, yeah, because uh, we believe the Americans really had access to it first. However, we're trying to crossing over in between two of them. And it's very close because our scientists are the same scientists as they have. So Klaus Fuchs was actually uh, German born, uh, defected over to Russia, eventually came over to England. So this is a guy that worked for us. And yet this is how they may have access to this secret of information. I think uh, uh, you're right on the right path here because we're basically crossing over same information at the same time. So Red Scare blew up because we have secrets, they have secrets. How's it going to get posted around and who's going to come out number one, just like the space race a few years later. So we're going to go into Los Alamos now. And this uh, program was conceived 
as the U.S. and the Soviet Union were allies during World War II, and the Soviet sympathizers were working with the U.S. in these uh, secretive projects like we just talked about. Uh, we do notice this billboard that you see on your way out. It says, what you see here, what you do here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. Sadly, that billboard did not work, and there was a lot of information being passed beyond the borders of Los Alamos. Okay, so let's get over to the American side now, the code breakers. These are the heroes, the unsung heroes of the story. While World War II was happening, there were some concerns with future relations with Stalin and the Soviet Union. Colonel Clark decided to do some preemptive code breaking to our then allies to protect us from future decisions. Gene Grable was living a boring life in Madison Heights, Virginia, 22 years old, teaching home ec. Nothing wrong with teaching home ec, she just wanted more. Pearl Harbor happened and Jean Graber's life would, Grable's life would be changed suddenly. She took a job working for an early version of the NSA and started decoding messages for $1,800 a year. And that was something she was happy to do even though that is not good money at that time. The project would be named Bonona. They also enlisted Meredith Gardner who was a brilliant linguist, could uh, teach six different languages at the University of Akron. He's the guy that's helping us decide these codes after Gene has uh, decoded it. Now you've got it in Russian, so he's going to work it back over to English language. So he helped immensely as well. Let's see a short video on these heroes. Even before World War II, the United States identified a need to look into the messages of its ally, soon to be enemy, the Soviet Union. And a program called the Nona was established. In 1946, U.S. Army crypt analysts and linguists had read more than 2,000 Soviet messages, uncovering massive espionage against the U.S. In addition to that, Soviet spy tradecraft was revealed. The Nona also brought to light more than 200 Soviet code names for American intelligence assets, Russian espionage against the U.S. atomic program, and information about the Communist Party in the United States itself. Well, I gotta tell you, we are extremely lucky to have these uh, genius mathematicians. And just to show you a little bit of what these Soviet codes are, I'm not gonna get into detail here, but essentially you're changing a word into a four digit number, which turns to a five digit number, and then you have a lot of uh, different processes. In total, there's about six processes, and then you gotta reverse back to translate. Well, the amazing part about our people on the Venona codes were they could actually decipher all this without having the original book to refer to. So they had no idea what these numbers meant at first, and eventually they could start getting a feel of what they were saying after a little bit. In the elementary world that they said for code breakers, this stuff was just basic. It was real easy to decode. However, if we're looking at it from your perspective, from my perspective, we can see we would go crazy trying to break down these numbers. But this little gal here, just like Gene Gravel, uh, this little girl would actually be perfect to decipher all these codes. And that's how she was. She's about 22 years old, so not much older than this little girl here. So. Uh, we do also want to go into um, the other side of this, and this is uh, very important to see the chain of command. This code is now actually bringing us to an idea of who's working with the Russians and the Soviets in here in America. So it does start at the very top. You can see that guy with all that red behind him on the very top right is Stalin. And notice all the red on those iconic pictures. Soviet intelligence resident was Vasily Zarevin. If you go to the left, you will see he's just the man down from Stalin. And then we get into uh, kind of the recruiters that are over in America. So you'll see a couple of guys that were even keel recruiting people specifically in New York. There's a lot of people that had communist ties with these young uh, communist groups. And that takes us to Julius Rosenberg. If you see him kind of off center over to the left, look at all these arrows coming out of Julius Rosenberg. He is commuting. He is basically getting all these people signed up to join the communist cause. Uh, so he was, I would call, essentially the ringleader. And amazingly, he was only making about $25 to do this. They would pay for your dinner when he was recruiting somebody. Julius wasn't getting a lot of money off of this, but he did believe in the cause. And we'll find out who Julius is in just a second. Uh, we do want to show the Rosenbergs together here, which here is Julius and his wife, Ethel. These are the two that would be uh, indicted later on for the electric chair. 
Julius was born in New York City, just a simple American to Jewish immigrant parents from Russia. Uh, he did attend City College in New York and was a leader of the Young Communist League in the USA. So on the surface, everything looks good. He's just a, a normal American. Unfortunately, what he does after hours is what got him into trouble. He did work with the US Signal Corps during the war. Amazingly, he'd already belonged to these communist leagues, but he still got to work with the US Army during the war until five years later, they finally figured out who he was and they fired him but that gave him access to documents and people that could help him for the cause. And you will see that Ethel is a big part of the story. And you remember that you're going to have to make a decision whether she deserves to live or die. So take these documents and see how much involvement she actually had. She was also born in New York to Jewish parents, and she was a, an aspiring actress, but she settled for a secretarial position at a shipping company. That's where she met Julius during a labor dispute meeting. Her brother was David Greenglass, whom she would help recruit him into communism. David Greenglass was great because he was working at Los Alamos, having access to all this. So just a very short and sweet, you're going to see a couple of guys that Julius knew, and this is Joel Barr and Alfred Sarant, who actually worked over on, on several uh, sensitive documents, things that the, the Americans did not want the Soviets to know, but they had access to everything, and that's the difficult part here. When you're safety inspectors, you get an idea of the entire picture, putting the puzzle together, where most of the scientists were working on one specific thing at a time. So this was a very important two to have an, an involvement, and Julius has recruited those guys as well. So just looking at the chain of command, I do want to show up that you can see the penalties, the, uh, the eventual uh, decisions uh, that these people had um, been sentenced to. And it's interesting because compared to Julius and Ethel, they got just a slam on the hand. I mean, basically nine years, 15 years. Martin Sobel on the uh, almost bottom center there, he was sentenced to 30 years. He got it about as worse as anybody besides Julius and Ethel. He had to serve 17 of those years in Alcatraz. So why do you think Julius and Ethel, they sentenced them to die, whereas everybody else uh, kind of got off pretty scot-free almost? Does anybody want to uh, make a comment on that? Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't gotten to the really nitty gritty yet, uh, but you will see those arrows going all over really shows that Julius was involved. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mitzi said because they were Russian. <laughs> yeah, they had Russian ties. That's exactly right. Um, so that is one reason. You're going to find out in a little bit, though, that Julius and Ethel may have been the only ones uh, not to rat out anybody. They were the ones that never fessed up to this thing. And so this is a good time to show off David and Ruth Greenglass. That is actually Ethel Rosenberg's brother. And you can see on the picture on the right, there they are arm in arm, sister and brother. Eventually to save his neck, David would rat out everything that his sister and his brother-in-law did. And so just to save himself and his wife, he sent his sister to the electric chair basically. It's a tough move for David. Out of this whole story, you might feel sorry for him when it's all said and done, we'll have to see. So Julius and Ethel still contended their innocence after 22 appeals. They were always being found the same results that they deserved to die. And here they are still not fessing up to it. So that is a great um, uh, look at it. You're seeing they have those connections to the Europeans. And during the war, it didn't seem like a big deal because they were our friends. But obviously, that would change quickly. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question on the, the form of uh, death that they were put to of, of what would happen, like what is the electric chair? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, it's a sad uh, side of our uh, capital punishment. And so they would uh, put you in a chair, uh, strap you up to electricity and send those bolts through your body. And it is a very horrific scene. And I would hope that none of you have to see that. Uh, but unfortunately, this is what we have uh, said that this is what they deserve because they shared secrets with the wrong people with the enemy. So let's go into a little bit of map so you can see how this process would work. And uh, you're getting a chance to see Harry Gold, the guy on the left side for the first time. Uh, based on the documents from the Venona project, we see the transfer of information from Los Alamos, New Mexico into the hands of Harry Gold, who was codenamed Gus. And you're gonna see some of these guys have uh, some interesting code names. Uh, some of them have uh, very um, tough code names. And whenever you see the name Enormous, and this is one of the actual Venona uh, documents, remember you have access to this that the public will not have 
access to until 1995. So cut and dry information may not be so evident to the public. When you see the name Enormous, that means the Manhattan Project. Uh, you can see where the uh, one of the lines down there in the middle says there's 71 groups unrecoverable, even though we we can decipher quite a bit of this. There's still a lot of those pages we weren't able to decipher. So this shows that they were not only able to decode a small percentage of the total messages, but the unfortunate part for the people convicted is the stuff they did decipher was in the middle of what they were able to, to translate. So Harry Gold, uh, who was the courier, his codename was Gus, and Klaus Fuchs was codenamed Rest. And you're going to see those two on a lot of these documents. So. We also want to show you another document here, and this kind of shows you the global movement of this information. Uh, we are going to show you a pretty good video here to show you Klaus Fuchs. I've mentioned him a lot. We're going to tell you who he is now. As we will see how this thing moved, uh, Greenglass, David Greenglass, who was Ethel's brother, of course, ratted her out later on. He's the guy that actually has access to all this and he's taking drawings. He's going home from memory and drawing up these specific plants. And these are the sketches of the high explosive lens mold and cross section of the atomic bomb as drawn by David Greenglass at the espionage trial, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Uh, Greenglass claimed that these were part of the secret information that was passed on to Julius Rosenberg. Greenglass obtained this information because he worked in the Manhattan Project. So very important to see these pictures. What's interesting is you talk to scientists that know the whole picture, they say this is nothing. So it's not really gonna help you build this bomb um, uh, so that really is not critical information, even though Greenglass thought he was uh, handing over some big important stuff. Now we'll go over to an interesting part to add to the courtroom drama. They asked David Greenglass to use this jello box to replicate and demonstrate Rosenberg's technique for handing over sensitive documents. He cut the flap up for a recipe of coconut Bavarian cream and the courier would have the other half. As Gold delivered his side of the box to Rosenberg, Julius would present his other side and if they matched up, then he knew that Gold could be trusted. So very interesting how we're using something as simple as a jello box to hand over information that could essentially kill millions of people down the road. So somewhat sad to think about that too. Here we will uh, get you into Rosenberg who will meet with a point of contact somewhere in New York and then the question mark will move over to Moscow and get this to the people that need it. So we will get an opportunity to see the question mark to Moscow and uh, some documents have very little information, but some documents like this one will have a wealth of valuable information. Uh, in the first paragraph, you'll see code names like Julius. Uh, his code name was liberal. Uh, when you get a code name, you are a very important part of this process. Ethel Rosenberg, however, was always known as Ethel. So here, uh, a liberal's wife is recommending Ruth Greenglass as a new player. They named her Ruth Greenglass in the original document, but eventually they would name her Wasp, which is one of my favorite code names there. So David Greenglass would be known as Caliber. That's a good one too. And uh, these two would be major players in this because they had code names. And yet Ethel throughout all of this will always be Ethel. So here we are to Eisenhower's dilemma, and this is what you're having to deal with now. Now you've seen the evidence from the decoded Soviet messages that nobody else will have access to. Uh, keep in mind, we don't want the Soviets knowing that we know their stuff. So we can't come public with this information, and that's going to be tough for Eisenhower to justify his actions. You have to keep all that secret, even though it's pretty cut and dry that these guys were involved. These were not made public until 1995. So that's your problem is you have to figure out how to uh, stress that the decision to execute will be proper or on the other side, it's improper and we're going to save it. So let's examine some primary documents that the public was very aware of 
of, and even in the press quite a bit of this was seen. And we will see if you can analyze these documents to help you make your decision. Let's start with Clyde R. Miller, who is a professor and a colleague of Ike's at Columbia University. I apologize, it's pretty quiet here. So while he's reading, I'm gonna tell you the gist of it. He's basically saying with justice and mercy would stand for the, just the opposite among tens of million the world over. We could expect the communist propaganda machine to make the most of that situation. As a student of public opinion, I have studied propaganda through the years and I'm confident they would exploit any appearance of injustice. He does believe, and we can kind of have you guys decide too, is he for uh, execution or against execution? What is his viewpoint here? And this is a great letter, it's about two pages long, but he is a good friend of Ike. They work together at Columbia, so he's, he's really into the propaganda exchange. He wants to make sure. Yeah. All right. So in the uh, enclosed publicity broadside about the Rosenbergs has any truth in it, and I suspect it may have, great harm would result, it seems to me, if their death sentence were carried out. That was the important part that I did not read to you. So, um, But this is this first part. Obviously, you can see that he was not supportive of the death sentence. So a little bit of document analysis beyond that. You remember who Clyde Miller was? What is the significance? It's gonna get a lot more fun here in a minute. We'll have some good letters here in just a second. Clyde's kind of sort of steady in uh, steady out of here. Yeah, Clyde was a good friend of Ike uh, and they worked together at Columbia University. So he's trying to grab his ear because they were they knew each other. And so uh, he's basically wanting them to get off uh, and him use his clemency. Let's go to Michael Rosenberg and you're gonna find out real quick who this kid is. Dear President Eisenhower, my mommy and daddy are in prison in New York. My brother is six years old. His name is Robbie. He misses them very much, and I miss them too. I got the idea to write to you from Mr. Otis on television. Please let my mommy and daddy go and not let anything happen to them. If they come home, Robbie and I will be very happy. We will thank you very much. Very truly yours, Michael Rosenberg. Okay, so obviously Michael Rosenberg is uh, Julius and Ethel's son. Look at the picture though. See how the media is kind of working this. Uh, they're really trying to get uh, your heartstrings here. If that letter didn't do it, if you didn't uh, just drop a tear just now. And then look at the uh, picture on the top right. It's two boys reading the newspaper. Uh, they get one more day. And so this is very important here. We, do we still see examples of this today? Absolutely. The media has a lot to do with how we feel about certain things. So they're not gonna give us Venona documents, but they're certainly gonna give us Michael Rosenberg there, so. Mrs. Dwight D. Eisenhower, I turn to you in my deep grief and implore you to intercede with President Eisenhower to grant mercy to my beloved children. I beg of you to act through the charity of your heart for an old woman whose days are spent in weeping. I beg of you to think of the two children for whom His Holiness, Pope Pius, has expressed compassion in his appeal for mercy. I will pray to the God of all of us for you in thankfulness for your compassion and help. This is Sophie Rosenberg. Okay, so Sophie Rosenberg was uh, Julius's mother. And who does she write the letter to? Did anybody catch that at the very beginning? She didn't go to President Eisenhower. Mrs. Eisenhower? Yes, that's right. Mrs. Eisenhower is the one. And why'd she do that? Because they're both mothers and she's trying to appeal to her uh, heart, to the charity in your heart, grant mercy to my beloved children. She's going mother to mother and hopefully maybe we'll uh, meet up with Ike later on and talk to him about what he needs to do. 
All right, we're gonna go over to another side here from Virgil Pinkley, who was a very important piece of this. He was with the Los Angeles Times, Los Angeles Mirror, had the largest circulation of papers at that time. So he definitely had the public's attention. And he says, dear Mr. President, your decision in connection with the Rosenbergs is the only possible one. We are dealing with traitors and spies in this instance. You can see how we feel out here based on the enclosures. Warmest personal regards, cordially Virgil. Let's see the enclosure. This is what he was talking about. This is a political cartoon that Virgil was talking about. Like many political cartoons, you need to know a little bit of history and backstories. So at the very top, it says Hall of Infamy. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Anybody want to jump into Infamy and tell us what it's all about? And then join in there as well. And then we can talk about Benedict Arnold that's already in the hall. So Hava and David say, so not good. Yeah, exactly right. And infamy is not being more than famous. It's actually the state of being well known for uh, some bad qualities. Uh, so the Hall of Infamy already has Benedict Arnold. Just to keep it short and sweet, Benedict Arnold was a very rotten guy during the revolution who sold secrets to the British. Essentially, he's saying the Rosenbergs did the same thing as Benedict Arnold, who till that point was probably the most famous spy in American history. Let's go over to uh, a little bit of a lengthy one here. We'll try to get through it a little bit quicker here, but this is a report on an interview with the Rosenbergs from prison. And this is a guy that basically said, look, it's the time to come clean. You're gonna be executed in just a couple of weeks. Let's uh, see if you guys can just tell us some information and we'll get you off that chair. Let's see what happens. On Tuesday, June 2nd, I interviewed Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in the death house at Sing Sing. I talked first with Julius in an interview room, which was made available to me by the warden. Following a short preliminary conversation about his health and the status of his case, I told him that it was part of my official duty to arrange for any visits he might care to request with government officials familiar with the details of his case. I told him that there seemed to be a feeling on the part of some government agencies that he was in possession of information which would be helpful in solving some as yet unanswered questions. I stressed the importance of early disclosure of any such information he might have giving government agents an opportunity to check on whatever statement he might make in view of the fact that execution date was only two weeks away. I had scarcely made known the purpose of my meeting when Julius launched on quite an emotionally charged tirade to the effect that he and his wife were the victims not only of a gross miscarriage of justice, but a deal by the government on the one hand and his brother and sister-in-law, David and Ruth Greenglass. He asserted that Attorney General McGrath was the architect of the plot and had somehow influenced the selection of Judge Kaufman as the trial judge and was generally responsible for the outcome. Yeah, and that's a great point there. He basically says, uh, why is it uh, fair that David and Ruth Greenglass are getting only 15 years and here we're sentenced to death? And he basically was pointing the finger at everybody else. It's too late for that. You basically need to come clean and tell us you were involved. And they still remained uh, moot on that point. So let's move into the court's decision. Judge Kaufman, pretty strong statement. I'm going to go through, I'm not going to go through all of it, but he said, I consider your crime worse than murder. Plain, de deliberate, contemplated murder is dwarfed in comparison with the crime you have committed. In committing the act of murder, the criminal kills only his victim. The immediate family is brought to grief. And when justice is meted out, the chapter is closed. But in this case, I believe your conduct is putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused. Then he goes on to say, it's your fault that 50,000 people died in the Korean War. It's your fault that many more millions are going to die because of the piece of papers that you handed over. That's the price of treason. You deserve to die. And that is Judge Kaufman. Pretty strong statement there. I think it's pretty clear on the way he feels whether uh, clemency should be used. So there you are, uh, President Eisenhower, you got a big decision coming up. So this is a very difficult decision to make. Do you agree? Do you believe that Eisenhower needs to grant clemency to Julius Rosenberg? That's the first question. We'll uh, open it up to you guys and we'll see if you guys want to open up all three if we answer this. So yes or no, do you think that Julius needs to get executive clemency? If you say yes, that means you're getting him off of the electric chair. So then go into the next one. As President Eisenhower, will you grant clemency to Ethel Rosenberg? Yes or no? 
this could be a different answer between the two. We'll see what you guys think. And then we want you to just give us a short statement as to why you're choosing yes or no. So we'll leave that up to you guys. If you want to type it, it's easier if you want to talk it out. So if we got that option, un unmute yourself there. All right, Aisha, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, I'd say um, yes to Julius Rosenberg and um, no to Ethel Rosenberg because Ethel is um, a mother and I have sympathy for her. Yes, that is a perfect answer. And I think that maybe if you deserve, anybody deserves a die, I would say Ethel does not. I would lean definitely to Julius. The question is how much involvement did Ethel have? She was a supportive wife. She typed a lot of letters. Uh, she was involved in these meetings. She wasn't completely innocent, but as a mother, and you saw mother to mother later, that was how it was. Okay. Uh, Sloth, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, it's not allowed. Oh, sorry. I, I, it won't allow me, hon, because um, your Zoom's not up to date. So feel free to type your answer. We have another answer that was typed in. Julius, no clemency. Ethel, yes, because of the children. Oh, wow. I do appreciate that. Yes, you're absolutely right. And we do believe that uh, Ethel um, did have a lot on her. And it would have been a case when Julius goes in, she could still go back and say, hey, I don't want to fess up now. But she, uh, we'll see if that's the decision she made. We'll see if uh, Ike's real decision, what that is. Does anybody else want to weigh on this? Uh, the last person here, let's see what you got. Okay, Sloth typed in, um, I say no to both. They did what they did to make money um, and they were desperate. So that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and maybe they should have just received a long prison sentence. Seems fair. Yeah, and I think a lot of people felt that way too. Hopefully, I can, if you guys are Eisenhower, hopefully the real Eisenhower feels the same way. We'll see if he does. One more. Yeah, we're, we're still getting some more answers in and most people say yes to Julius yeah. um, and then to, uh, don't give him clemency, yeah. um, but to give it to, to Ethel. She didn't, she didn't deserve it. Gotcha. And these pictures of these poor little boys, they desperately need their mother. You can't lose both your parents. That would be a tragedy, right? So let's see, uh, do we want to get one more or we want to see the decision? This is one, um, clemency to both um, from Deborah, prison sentences instead. Not sure if they were given a fair trial. Yeah, that's exactly right too. And uh, just when you bring a replica jello box in, you know there's something not quite legit there. Pause, uh, also because David Greenglass was just trying to save his own neck. So that's something very interesting to, to tap into too. If I had another two hours, we could definitely get into the trial itself. So. Um, but if you go to the uh, Eisenhower Foundation website, you are going to see so many great more uh, accompanying documents. But here we go to the decision of Ike, the official decision. The crime for which the Rosenbergs have been found guilty and sentenced far exceeds the taking of the life of another citizen. It involves the deliberate betrayal of an entire nation and could very well result in the death of many, many thousands of innocent citizens. The courts have provided every opportunity for the submission of evidence bearing on this case. All rights of appeal were excised and the conviction of the trial court was upheld after full judicial review. I have made a careful examination of this case and am satisfied that the two individuals have been accorded their full measure of justice. Okay, that is uh, what Ike from his words said. So basically you see what was the decision? What did Ike decide to do? Anybody want to quickly weigh in on that? Aisha, I'm going to unmute you. Um, Eisenhower sentenced them to death by electric chair. That's exactly right. And, uh, and we saw a lot of information, uh, but he was still strong enough and confident that the country will support his decision and he'll stay with Judge Kaufman, who was adamant about executing these two. So. Uh, we do um, really understand the moral of the story, I suppose, if you're going to leave here with anything, just fess up. Uh, make sure you admit to the wrongdoing that you do. We got something else here. Was it Judge Kaufman that granted the execution, not Eisenhower, or was it? Yeah, so basically it works like Judge Kaufman is the one that decided they deserve because of the espionage. As the letter of the law, they're supposed to be executed. 
uh, Eisenhower could only get involved by using his clemency to say, you guys are good to go. Whether he's going to lessen the sentence or free them completely, he could have done that. Clearly, he did not do that. And his evidence pretty much kind of, kind of coincides with Judge Kaufman, who said, you know, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, Deborah asked a great question. It says, was Eisenhower concerned about public support or re-election with this decision? I mean, that's all we think about now, but I think ultimately Eisenhower was handed over this document in his first days as president. It's a tough decision to make. And the other tricky part about this is if you show weakness to the Soviets, they're going to keep coming over here and trying to take many, many more people to spy for them if we're not going to have any uh, true penalty for these people. There had to be a martyr. All right, Emily makes a good point. She says, I feel like much of this was set as an example for others. They served a bigger purpose. Yes, that's Emily, that's perfect. That's uh, perfectly said. And I will tell you that that is the sad state of it. They just got to be the martyr for a cause to keep the uh, Soviets from getting too much information from us. So until 1980, this Venona uh, was still being uh, used in the, and from what we know, the Soviets did not know about any of it until about 1980. So there was a lot of people that may have been saved by this whole thing. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining us today with the Red Scare Spies Among Us. Uh, please visit our website for more programs on EisenhowerFoundation.net. And there's a lot more accompanying documents on this particular case as well. If you want to see some more Venona documents and things, they are definitely there. So thank you again, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you, everybody.